Good morning. I apologize for being a couple of minutes late getting to the party this morning. And uh, it's good to be with you. I am thankful for the goodness and the blessings of God toward all of us. We have much to be thankful for. It's easy to fall into a state and condition of uh, being unappreciative. It's one of the things that happened with Lot. I deal with it in the little book, um, Bad Decisions, The Legacy of Lot. Uh, he, was, he was unthankful. He was unappreciative of all of the benefits that, that came his way. And it became a habit of life. It was a posture of life. I, I don't want to become thankless. I don't want to be unappreciative. I want to celebrate God's goodness to me. And I, I think you feel exactly the same way. Uh, as we get into this today, let me celebrate again that Calvary is in the process of moving toward owning our own property again. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, can't wait until some of you who are part of Calvary online will be uh, coming to see us. Several of you who are here in Springfield that I ran across in our city and uh, you've commented on the teaching and preaching that we're doing online and our services being online. Uh, I, I want to see you. I, I look forward to you being a member not just of Calvary Online but also being a part of establishing and growing a strong, powerful congregation in uh, our part of this city. And uh, please pray to that end. Let the Spirit guide you. If you are backslidden, if you're lost, perhaps you've never been to a Pentecostal church in your entire life, but the Spirit has been speaking to you, then I would encourage you uh, to come. As a matter of fact, come tonight. We are at... Um, the Free Will Baptist Church, 2635 West Nichols, and we are there in the gymnasium. We'll be for a couple more months as we move in and do a little bit of work uh, at uh, the new site for Calvary. So, great time to be in the church, great time to have the Holy Ghost, great time to be working for God. Again, this morning, if you will start a watch party, if you will tag this to somebody who would benefit from it, if you could... Uh, share, comment, ask a question, anything that, that you can do. I feel prompted, and I believe it is in the Spirit, and sometimes what we think is prompted of the Spirit is, is something else entirely, but I, I think I feel prompted in the Spirit in the future, and I will likely do this as part of the Sunday uh, afternoon online messages, is to uh, introduce the idea of, and this would kind of be the premise I'd be working on. I'm not sure that this is the title. I am a oneness Pentecostal. Am I a false prophet? And simply approach some theological positions and attempt to answer questions, be pretty aggressive in, in marketing and presenting, not in the intent of tearing down any other theological position, but in the intent of showcasing what it was that the New Testament church taught. So pray to that end, if you uh, will, that God will guide and that he will direct. And uh, let's get into the scripture today. And we're in Acts chapter 2. And uh, we have had the outpouring of the Spirit. Uh, Simon Peter has explained to those who had questions and those who mocked and actually uh, what we're going to get into is he is continuing his explanation. But uh, he, has, uh, he has pointed out that they're not drunk, as you suppose. And then he moves in to beginning to talk about Jesus. And I want to read this entire uh, portion, these three verses that we're addressing right now, to give some context to it. Ye men of Israel, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Okay, so one of the things that occurred to me in study this morning is that to this point, what Peter is saying to these folk is that Jesus of Nazareth, a man validated 
by God. To this juncture, he has not begun to bring to their senses or to bring to their attention the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, that this was actually God manifest in the flesh. Okay, verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have cru crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains or, as I talked about yesterday, the pangs or snares of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay, uh, when we read the second chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 22, is where Peter begins preaching to convince and for some we have a we have a tendency to want to move from Acts 221 down to Simon Peter's closing in Acts 2 32 through 36 which is then followed again by the followed by the question of the audience what shall we do and Peter's response uh, giving them instruction regarding salvation from sin we, we like to kind of make that move pretty quick but it, it shouldn't be so because number one this is the first bible example of evangelistic preaching and in, in in many ways it was not preaching as much as it was teaching to convince and to compel i'm not sure that peter uh, other than having to lift his voice because of the vastness of the audience, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that there would have been a whole lot of, of screaming, and there's certainly no hellfire preaching in this. But instead, he takes scripture and he uses it to convince. Okay. The second reason that this is important is because that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 31, uh, Simon Peter takes his audience, he brings them from where they were, which is having questions and mocking, and then the explanation, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. In these verses, he moves beyond the immediacy of what they see and he brings into the conversation Jesus of Nazareth a man a man approved of God he brings in Jesus of Nazareth he brings in the affirmation through the signs the miracles and the wonders that Jesus performed Third, he brings in the fact that this audience and wicked, lawless hands had taken this one who had done miracles, signs, and wonders and had crucified him. Okay, so there have been the signs, the wonders, and the miracles, and he has talked about the outpouring of the Spirit. But all of that must not overshadow the crucifixion because there is no outpouring of the Holy Spirit if there had been no crucifixion. Peter takes his audience back to Calvary. He takes them back to Calvary where that eventually they can see their sin where that they can see their condition. Okay? He shows them that what has happened is not an accident of history, but that God has been intentionally involved, that he foreknew and he determinedly counseled that there was going to be a crucifixion of the Son of God. And so he 
he again is is positioning them to understand that what's happening here is not just politics. This this is not Roman government and Jewish religious leaders having their way and pursuing their own means, but or, or their own objective. But this is a God thing. Okay, this is a God thing. He wants them to see that. And then he is going to, we've, we've not got there, we'll be in the next section. He, he wants them to see not the crucifixion as the end, but he wants them now to observe the resurrection as it had been prophetically declared by King David. Because if you simply have a crucifixion and a death and a tomb, there is no New Testament story. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. But the resurrection defines the unlimited power of God. Death could not hold him. Spiritual death, in my opinion, never took hold of him, as it will not take hold of any who are saints of God. Physical death took hold of him, but it could not retain him. That's powerful. Okay, let's go back to the same verse of Scripture that we spent time with yesterday, and I will not be with you as long as I am sometimes today. I don't think. Sometimes we get into this and inspiration comes. But verse 24 says of Jesus, whom God hath raised up, having loosed, and talked about it yesterday, he broke up or dissolved the pains or the pangs, birth pangs, and again, odd use of words, but also used as a snare of death, having loosed him from the snare of death. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay. The, the word because could be uh, translated in as much, in as much as it was not possible that he should be holden. Uh, the word holden there uh, kind of has connection with our idea of taking hold of another person or of something and using our strength on that thing. Okay? So death took hold of him, but death could not hold him. So let's look at that word because. Um, uh, when I see because, I'm I'm still enough of a kid to ask why. Did your mom ever ever get exasperated with you constantly barraging her with question about doing something? I want to, I want to, and you finally say, well, why, why, why? And she says, because I said so. And. I think many of us have responded it because why? Because why? Because that has not given us an answer. Okay, so let's look at that here. Because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Not be it, it was not possible. It it was it was just something that could not be. So why was it not possible? And this is in some ways, a reiteration of some things we talked about yesterday. Number one, Jesus owed no penalty for sin. And death is the penalty for sin. He did not owe that. A payment from him could not be required for sin he had not committed. The second thing is that the snare of death dissolved in his holy presence. He was without sin. He was set apart. There was none like him in his sinless condition. There have been many, many 
lambs offered as sacrifices. There have been many days of atonement, but there have been no sacrifice like this sacrifice. Hidden to the eye of all high priests and of all priests who serve, there would have been some blemish in every sacrifice that had ever been offered. But in this instance, when Jesus went to Calvary, as the sacrifice, as the Lamb of God, not my Lamb, God's Lamb. I couldn't provide that Lamb. God provided the Lamb. It was without any blemish whatsoever, and death had to dissolve its snare. Third thing is because that he was God manifest in the flesh, and uh, death is very limited in what it's going to do with God. It's 100% man and 100% God. seems like I say that quite often. Death could not hold him. Death could not hold him. When there is the catching away of the church, dead in Christ will rise first. And those which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Death will not hold us. You say, well, well, Pastor, I've sinned, so death has a hold on me. Well, I have sinned too. But the strength and the power of sin, this thing that holds, this snare, death, our sin, our sin, and the penalty of our sin, the payment of your sin and mine, is taken care of by Jesus. He bore our sin. Okay, now there's a there's a phrase in this that that uh, bears consideration. Uh, the Bible says that it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It was not possible. It was impossible. Now, when you begin to think about Christianity in the modern times that we live in. The word impossible is used as a critique of the church. That's not possible. It's not possible that people still speak in other languages in praise to God. It is not possible for that blind baby in Illinois to receive its sight. It's not possible for Sis DeVille's cancer, where she had been given months to live, where she has now living, lived almost 50 years with it, and every once in a while it comes back and she says, and in Jesus' name, that was spoken into submission and I refuse to allow it back. All of that's impossible. Well, that's the terminology of the agnostic and the atheist and, and unfortunately there are even liberal theologians and I don't understand how a person who does not believe in the miraculous and does not believe in the power of God to deliver and to heal and that Jesus is actually going to catch his church away. I, I can't understand how they ever even imagined that Jesus came the first time. So there is this concept that is part of our culture that it's not possible but it's used in a different way. Instead now it's used to speak of what happens or what should happen in the body of Christ and what should happen as people are converted. When Jesus' body 
was no longer in the tomb. That resurrection brought the it is not possible group front and center. You know what their response was to the resurrection? Though they knew it to be untrue, they paid the guards to lie, saying that Jesus' disciples had stole his body. All of that was a, was a tale, obviously. But I want you to think about this. The people who paid the guards to say that knew they knew it was not true. They absolutely knew it was not true. But they preferred protecting their set out political and theological position. And we'll get into the politics and the theology in Acts chapter 4. But they prefer protecting their set out political and theological position over seeking to learn more and affirm that a miracle of world-changing proportion had happened among them. The Sanhedrin court, Annas and Caiaphas, who were involved in priesthood, they were defending the indefensible. How much different things would have been in Jerusalem if Annas and Caiaphas, along with the Jewish leadership, had shouted from the top of the temple, something of God is taking place here. We can't explain it. It doesn't fit our ideology, doesn't fit our theology, doesn't fit our explanation, but we won't argue that it is not of God. As a matter of fact, we're telling all of you, you need to get to checking this out because God is doing something. Instead, they wanted to present it as an impossibility. I I'd like to extend and encourage all of this listening audience and we go around the world through the process of the next day or so, I, I would like to give you an open invitation to explore rather than defend. Now, now, this is an important premise. Explore rather than defend. Think about what happened when the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem seeking the one who had been born king of the Jews. Herod asked the knowledgeable Jewish teachers what they knew about this. Oh yeah, we know. Six miles down the road in a little village called Bethlehem, Judah. That's where he's going to be born. And they did nothing to investigate. People from a distant land looked at it. They wanted to explore it. They wanted to see what was going on. Talking to somebody today, your experience with Christianity and with religion has been somewhat boring and limited and constrained and there is no joy and there is no power. I want to encourage you to Explore instead of defend. Explore what God did in the book of Acts. Explore the doctrine and the teachings of the book of Acts. Explore the instructions of Paul regarding Christian living. Explore what God is doing in 2020 as there is a restoration. Now, we're not protesting anything. That's the that, that's the Protestant movement. It was a protest against the state church. We're not protesting. We're seeing a restoration. We're seeing a restoration. Why don't you, instead of saying, that's not possible, that may be what elders and voices of your in your life have always declared, but instead of just taking that at face value, how about doing some exploring for yourself. Look at the scripture within its context. Study it. It was not possible. So the agnostic, the atheist, and the unbeliever says it's not possible. But God takes that same position when he is confronted with unbelief regarding the resurrection. It was not possible 
that he should be holden of death. He was without sin. He had no wages of sin to collect. It is unthinkable. It is unimaginable that Satan and death would triumph. It was not possible. It was not possible. Let's take that same premise. It was not possible to the consideration of the power of resurrection. If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, you'll quicken your mortal bodies. So the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Death was set aside. What are the needs in your life? What are the circumstances of addiction? What are the struggles that you deal with on this day? What are the family break points that you're not sure you can live to overcome? Why not explore that the power of the resurrection? Your counselor may have said it's not possible. Your family said you're beyond hope. Your parents have abandoned you. They've decided that you're never going to straighten up and get it right. What is impossible to man? is possible to God. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. This Jesus, this Messiah, this Savior of the world, His power, His ability, the spirit of resurrection, it'll do a work in you. Just as it brought Jesus out of that tomb, now, when we move into new material tomorrow, we will be stepping into Acts chapter 2, verse 25 uh, through 31. And uh, this, is the, this is the crux of the matter in his message. This is where he's going to prepare it to punch home with a knockout blow regarding their behavior. I'd like for you to read this. Read it two or three times. Verse 25 through 31. I'd like for you to give the paragraph a title. And I'd like for you to find the key phrase or scripture. may even be part of a scripture. could be two scriptures. That you think really draw out what this is all about and then take it a step further do a little bit of questioning of the text examine it and uh, there's there's a lot here uh, Peter is going to quote the Psalms at least twice and make reference to a third if I'm memory serving right uh, go back and read those Psalms See if you can discover which psalms they are and decipher, if you can, why Peter would use these to apply them to Jesus Christ. Okay, now I'm, I'm challenging you to do a little bit of the work yourself here because what I tell you, you'll retain a fingernail of it. But what you dig out for yourself, you will retain in a much greater magnitude. If you'd like to sow seed into Springfield Calvary, I tell you what, we really need, and we really need to take our property to the place we'd like for it to be. We, we need about $50,000 
that is not currently in hand and um, it doesn't affect our buying or moving in but we, we would really like to do some updating that will immediately make it a credit if you'd like to help springfieldcalvary.church is the website upper right hand corner uh, anything that you give you don't have to give the 50,000 if you'd like to I'll send you a copy of every book I've ever written <laughs> and, uh, but if you'd like to help we would sure be appreciative of it thank you let me pray for you and there are people in your life and in your world who need this particular message why don't you send it to them where that they can begin to think about exploration rather than defense. Where that they can think about what God can do and that there really are no impossibilities with Him. That the power of the Holy Ghost can transform their life. For Calvary's church family here in town, see you tonight. For those who are in our city, but have not yet visited. We'd love to see you at 7 this evening, 6.30. We do come together in prayer. Let's plan on God doing a very special thing among us. Father, I come to you today and thankful for the church, thankful for your goodness, thankful for your word. God, you've answered so many prayers for us this year. You're protected. You've kept your hand on. Our friends today that are desperately sick yet again with the coronavirus, men that have invested much into my life. Oh, God, raise that man from the ICU. Raise him. Heal him, make him well. God, I pray that you provide the financial resources that we need to take this forward. God, let us have great revival. I thank you for the goodness of the Master. Jesus, you've blessed me. You've blessed me. You've blessed me. I look forward to what you'll do the rest of this day. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say amen. And I'd like to see a guest come tonight, walk up and introduce themselves and say, Pastor, I've been watching online and I decided to show up show up you'll be blessed matter of fact show up uh, you and i'll just go get a cup of coffee after church how about that all right love you god bless